on the screen in front of you is just a scrap of perhaps humanity's oldest and most inclusive and most preciously meaningful work of collaborative art. It's much, much older than the works of art in caves, at, say, Blombos or Lasco that you may have heard of, or Altamira or Sulawesi. In many ways, uh, it, it resembles them, though. It was buried, in some sense, from us, from our site, for eons. And we've only recently gotten a glimpse of it. And it reflects much of our history in ways that we'll talk about and that are very revealing. And it's actually a self-portrait. It's a group self-portrait of humanity itself. We remake it every generation. It's like a graffiti wall that gets constantly remade and repainted. And it's never finished in that sense. So it's a work of art that's at once the oldest and the newest every day of our lives. If we sweep across here, what we've done is we've asked the computer to reveal this art to us. We've read the DNA of many thousands of people from all over this planet. We feed those DNA letters to a computer and we say, Computer, if we give you a palette of K colors, let's say 10 colors, look at each person's genome, and they're a, a thin thread in this tapestry. Look at each person's genome. Look for patterns, clusters of genetic spellings that match up between that person and others in the group, and pick a color, and color in the mix for that person, the likeliest mix of their 10, in this case, ancestral pools each of those ancestral pools being one of the colors, one of the hues. And if we scan across from left to right, we go from southern and central Africa, where we have people who are the most genetically diverse on the planet, San people, central African foragers. Scanning across within Africa, there's a lot more diversity. It's, it's here just shown as really as pink. We didn't give the computer enough colors to fill in all the splendid diversity that we find in our most diverse, long settled place. But scanning further across into Eurasia, we see other, other colors coming in. And you'll notice there's a lot of spatial kind of structure here. So it's not a random hodgepodge. It's also not simple bars of 10 different colors. Everyone is a mix. One of the take homes, please, to remember today from genetics, and you may know it already, is that every one of us has ancestors from all over the planet who pooled their lot. And in many ways, you are their living dream of many thousands of people from all over the planet. This is a picture of that in one snapshot of, of a bunch of people. I want to focus today on one part of the picture, because I think it tells us about how looking into the past and seeing this beauty, there's, as always, truth in the beauty. And the truth is actually vitally important for us to know about today and to think about in our lives. So let's focus today first on the people within this tapestry who happen to be Arabic speakers. It's one of the most widely spoken languages. I think about 420 million people around the planet speak Arabic. And here is a look at some of them across uh, the wide regions in which that language family is spoken. Starting on the left, here are some Moroccans. Look at the colors that we see in their mix. They're fairly consistent from person to person. They vary, of course, because everyone is unique. But we see a little bit of gold at the bottom, a little bit of green, but a lot of this bright, bright lemon yellow. And at the top, we see some of the pink that we saw earlier in West Africa. That's the mix that comes together in Morocco. If we move across to other Arabic speakers, say in the Arabian Peninsula, so Yemeni and Saudi folk, their genomes look very different. They have a lot more of the light gold. And those folks um, have a lot of variation that you can see. And then let's move to a third group. So here we have folks in a very small patch of the planet, and actually not that far from the Arabian Peninsula itself. It's you know, sort of a, a coast of it. But within that region, actually folks look very different from the way that, that many folks look on the, the peninsula itself. So these are Levantine people. So for example, if we look here, we see Egyptians. They have some of the lemon yellow near the top that we saw in Morocco. We could think of that as maybe a North African ancestral pool of some kind. They have a lot of this green that we'll talk about. And they have some of the gold that we saw in the Arabian Peninsula, but a lot less of it. Moving across to, say, Syrians, we see less of the yellow, less of the North African, some more mix in of red that we'll talk about. And if we move across to Lebanese Muslims, we see a little bit more of that red again. If we look across to Lebanese Christians and Druze, similar mix, a little bit less of the red, a little bit less of the brown at the top, and a little bit less of the West African pink. But everybody in this whole region of the Levant, regardless of religion, their mixes look fairly similar. So we could ask a question, what if we look at what's common to these different Levantine groups? 
the gold at the bottom, the big green in the middle, the brown at the top, and the sort of laced lemon throughout. You know, the folks in the southern part have more West African pink, the folks in the north have less. But what if we tried to ask, what are those ancestral pools coming together? What does that represent about history? Although the computer didn't know any of this history, it just guessed based on the patterns, we can actually see, when we look at other populations, neighbors of these folk, what the likely history is here. And I want to liken it to a recipe for food. So let's look at the green, for example. That green shows up in other Eastern Mediterranean populations and Mediterranean populations. Think of it as olive oil. Think of it as Greece. Think of it as Turkey. Those, those parts of the world where olives grow and flourish. That ancestral pool has been part of this mix for a long time. Now let's talk about the brown at the top. Think of that as, say, chickpeas. So this might be sort of more arid farming people in the distant past coming from the Iranian plateau, from the inner steppes of Southwest Asia, from the Fertile Crescent. And then third, we have the gold coming in from the bottom. And you could think of that as maybe the sesame of the Arabian Peninsula that we saw earlier. Think of those three things coming together and then a spritz of lemon, as we saw, coming from North Africa. If we put those together, we can basically say, well, the, the Levantine mix is pretty consistent and it's basically like hummus. Right? It's not a bad recipe for hummus. You probably want to add some garlic. If we think of this as sort of like it's been, it's been mixed together like hummus for such a long time that it becomes its own discernible singular thing in a way. And this is sort of a Levantine mix genetically. So how old, we could ask, is this recipe for, for hummus? How, how, when did these ingredients come together in the human past? And it turns out that when we look at other ancient DNA and archaeological evidence, etc., a, a fairly consistent picture, a story comes together. And especially, for example, if we look at ancient Levantines, who are, this is the actual bodies of people who were found preserved well in Sidon, in the Levant, about 3,700 years ago. Their genomes can be read now, and this is what they look like. The hummus is there, folks. The hummus is already there 3,700 years ago. It's basically a nice blend of the same, much of the same ingredients we saw, not quite as spiced, but it's much of the same ingredients. And if we look today at their neighbors, 60 miles away, modern Palestinians, the mix, the hummus looks very similar. There's about 3,700 years worth of added spice that's come in from various parts of the world. But basically, modern Palestinians' genomes look a lot like ancient Levantine genomes 3,700 years ago. Now, why does this matter? It matters for several reasons. First, as we know now, truth matters a lot. Truth matters in all contexts, medical contexts, uh, all kinds of social contexts. But it matters in science, too, in genetics. And so we, we need to get our truth out about what we know about the past from, from genetics to pull together with what's known otherwise. But it matters for more personal and poignant reasons, too, because as an Ashkenazi Jew, as a Jew, I've come to see people in my own part of that tapestry, the ones whose mixes are most close to mine, the threads I can reach out and pull by a phone call, I've started to see misinformation spread in ways that really, really pain me and hurt others. This is time to set the record straight genetically to try to get that truth out for that vital reason. So let's talk about that. One of the fun things about science is that it's interesting, and you never know who might weigh in on a given new genetics paper. In this case, we have a tweet from Benjamin Netanyahu, who I guess has a lot of time on his hands now. He's pleading that a new study of DNA recovered from an ancient Philistine site near Ashkelon in Israel confirms what we know from the Bible, that the origin of the Philistines is in southern Europe. Now, this has a lot of, of dog whistle meaning because people know that Philistine in Arabic comes from a Roman word that was taken from an earlier people called the Philistines, and it became our word Palestine. So Bibi here is letting you think that a DNA study has found that Palestinian people are European, which would have political implications for you know, land rights and things like that. Well, let's look at the actual study that he's talking about. So ancient DNA sheds light on the genetic origins of early Iron Age Philistines. Now we're talking about 3,300 years ago, so later than 3,700. And they looked at the DNA, and here's what the study says verbatim. We find that all three Ashkelon populations derive most of their ancestry from the local Levantine gene pool. I don't know if BB missed that sentence, <laughs> but he may have. So let's, hopefully he'll watch the talk. But um, in any case, that's the truth. You've seen it already. 3,700 years ago was already true. 3,300 years ago, what the paper found was that there was a little pulse of immigration, or maybe even refugees. We don't know who they were. Families in Ashkelon, for a brief period of time, some of the individuals were like part European, part Levantine. 
And they mixed into the fold. They, they stirred into the hummus more spice. That's the story of that paper that BB is trying to spin into a much bigger story that would actually disenfranchise and, and really leave without a homeland a whole people. So let's talk about that canard because it recurs not just through BB. We hear it from many quarters now. So the Australian Jewish Association weighing in on history as they are wont to do. The term Philistine means invaders. Well, actually, the term Hebrews originally meant outsiders as well. So lots of ancient terms and for peoples that get dubbed by somebody else that happen to mean something like outsider. Right? This happens a lot in human history. And BB goes on to say, well, this is all well and good, but Palestinians whose ancestors came from the Arabian Peninsula to the land of Israel thousands of years later. Well, we just saw that's absolutely not true. Palestinian genomes look very Levantine and very different from Saudi genomes, from Yemeni genomes, from peninsular Arab genomes. So the facts are Palestinian DNA shows consistently deep and thick local roots. By thick, I mean that most of the ancestry is from right there. There's a little spice, but it's mostly just Levantine with very little new ancestry from elsewhere. Netanyahu's son weighed in on, on Palestinian surnames, noting that you know, Halabi means coming from Aleppo and therefore they're, not, they're foreigners. Lots of surnames in Palestine attest to this as well. Askelani is from Ashkelon, the same town in that paper. Kudsi means from Jerusalem. Safadi from Safed, Studi from Ashdod. Right? Lots of Palestinian surnames attest to that locality. Surnames change, and they reflect power more than consistently reflecting DNA. My own surname, Pearson, is not an Ashkenazi surname. It was taken in Canada in 1910 to assimilate. Does that make me Norse? <laughs> you know, is Denzel Washington English? <laughs> because after all, most American Washingtons are black Americans. Likewise, does Netanyahu, whose surname and familiarly was Milikowski from a village in Poland called Milikow, does that make him Polish? Here's the next stretch of our tapestry. So here we have folks who look like hummus, but with some red, some major, major red added. Who are these people? These are European Jews. European Jews and Levantines. You see the hummus-like mix, but with a lot more of this red. And we'll see where this red is coming from in a moment. Let's look at their other neighbors. These are other non-Jewish Europeans. So here we have the Jews. There we have French non-Jews. So you can see the peninsular Arab gold is gone, basically. And much of the North African ancestry is even gone among non-Jewish French folk. Here are Hungarians, a very similar mix, a little bit more of the gold and a little bit more of this dark blue coming in. And when we look at Russians, we see much of that dark blue. So we can think of that as like an Arctic blueberry, North Asian blue <laughs> stirring into their mix. So everybody's got recipes, and, and they're actually quite consistent from person to person across a population, which is really cool, right? But European Jews like this interesting mix of like hummus and beets, maybe? A slice of beet and some hummus, that's a pretty tasty treat. Let's talk about canard number two, which is the one we also hear from other quarters. So here's Joseph Massad, a political and intellectual historian at Columbia, who frankly should know better, because there's been plenty of research out there about this now, and I'm happy to talk with him, as are others. Massad claims research has established for many decades that European Christians and Jews were native European converts to Palestinian religions and not descendants of, the, of their original adherents. Well, we just saw in the mix, we saw some pretty clear hummus in the European Jewish mix. The European Jews that we looked at in that mix, those include both Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews. So Spanish and Iberian Jews and Central European German-speaking Jews, historically. Both of them show the same mix, pretty much. And they both belie this claim that, uh, that they are not descendants of likely original adherents in the Levant. OK, we see this elsewhere, too. This story has been ricocheting around the internet for a while. Some very, very poorly done science trying to meld DNA with linguistics about Yiddish and claiming that Yiddish is a Persian language that was then relexified into a Slavic language that was relexified with Turkic and then relexified into German, all to be done as a secret trading language that any German can understand. It makes no sense, and it does not, and, and most importantly from the DNA evidence, it would, it would imply that Sephardi Jews who spoke Judeo-Spanish have exactly the same history that's not Levantine. So in any case, the data that are really, really consistent at this point suggest that Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews, like many other Jewish groups, have clear, consistent Levantine roots from person to person. And though as deep as Palestinians' Levantine roots, they go back likewise to the same period of time 
when those three groups came together. And by the way, we think they came together when there was climate change in the peninsula, and it dried up around 6,000 years ago. That's when the sesame came into the mix. Those roots go as deep in European and other Jews, but they're thinner. They're far thinner because of admixture elsewhere in exile, as we saw here in European Jews with European folk. So once again, the DNA reveals a lot more than, say, my surname or Netanyahu's surname would reveal. This matters for each of you. You may, not, you may or may not be as close to this kind of quest and question as I am as a geneticist and someone who has family with deep interests in this region. There are other regions that have similar histories that DNA can inform. But we've seen time and time again an urge in human history to segregate, to separate peoples, to claim one homeland and, and bar others from it. Majority by Group X would mean our disappearance, and we will not commit national suicide. The only alternative is separate development. The germ of this policy is inherent in almost all of our history, implanted for self-preservation. This quote is from A.L. Geyer, from the founding text of apartheid. He was speaking here about the history of, of Boers, of Dutch South Africans who had been oppressed by the British, but not nearly as much as others, their neighbors, and were in turn oppressing. This story recurs all too often in our history. Here's another quote. To separate group Y from us is not only liberal, but generous. Because he will not mingle, we kindly offer him a new home. That's Andrew Jackson, banishing Cherokee, Creek, and Choctaw people from their home in Southeast US, in Georgia, to Oklahoma, where they were forcibly displacing others. Nothing about the story of the Trail of Tears was anything but tears. Everyone involved were slaveholders. People got dragged along of African ancestry as well. It was a horrific example of people excluding native people from their land, and we happily don't do this today. We, Georgia does not bar Choctaw people from resettling. Last, we have in the 30s in the US, to maintain our civilization, there's one solution, segregation or deportation. Again, spatial segregation of the peoples being the goal. Well, that led us to 1948, and we've seen this recur time and again. In 1948, we had partition, but we'd seen it before. We Jews had seen the ghettos, the mellas, the pale. We'd seen Indian removal, we'd seen segregation, separate but equal, everything, restricted covenants and housing in the US through 1968. And of course, we saw apartheid from 1953 to 1990. All of them displacing people forcibly from land in order to not have to share it, not have to live together democratically. Today, we have one left, the only country, the only place on the planet where the families with the deepest roots, the thickest roots on the land in question, are barred from settling there. All while people like me are welcomed to settle there because our ancestors were banished 80 generations ago. That no longer seems fair at all to me, much as I may have grown up with dogma about it. And I hope that you will take time to think about this tapestry. This is our social fabric. It's a story of mixing. It's ongoing, and it depends on each of us to make it a pluralist, ongoing palette that we, that we swirl together. So think today, if you don't know enough people from a group that you fear, that you, that you think may want to, to disappear you, please just meet five of them. Get to know them individually as artists, scientists, activists, whatever they may do. They may have all different human paths like you've heard today. Get to know them as people and as families before as monolithic words like invaders. And thanks very much for listening. To <laughs>